Right. We are going live on YouTube. Okay. Can you tell the numbers of people signing in? Yeah, 240 now. For this one, and how about the YouTube? We're going live on YouTube. And the uh, Chinese Ghana channel, a lot of people there. Um, it's it's the numbers are going up now. It says four. Ali is clicking faster than the second. <laughs> Okay, but we'll just give yeah. just a couple of minutes. YouTube, YouTube is filling up now. Okay. I mean, it can't fill up because it's YouTube, but you know, it's lots of people are joining now. Well, do you have the number so we can tell if a lot of people who wanted to join are on? 48 now. Okay. Kylie is saying that uh, 1,800 Chinese resident and neurosurgeons are on there. Okay. 1,800? Yes, sir. Yeah, from the number China. are rolling so fast, I'll give a few more minutes. Yeah, I will give a few more minutes. Because the, we forwarded them to a different uh, kind of uh, um, address. Am I still being shared to my screen? Yeah, you can unshare it. Okay. If you'd like, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. But uh, yeah. But this is the old. Let me get the new one. One second. Um, hey, Dad, for everything that's coming in question-wise from the YouTube, do you want me to just text them to you? Yeah. Because there's a question box on YouTube as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
Gina? Yep. Yeah. What's the YouTube number so far? So we know if there is enough, we can get started. Uh, I, YouTube is at 52, and there's 345 in here now. OK. And how many from China, you said? Uh, hmm. 1,800. 1,800. Okay. Now there should be more. Now, 2,190. Okay. All right. I think we can we'll go ahead and get started then. All right. Do you want me to mute anybody or do you want to leave all of the panelists open the whole time? I think whoever starts speaking, you can mute the others. Okay, so um, do you want to unshare your screen so that we can see the faces? Start, no, keep me shared. I'll start with a couple of slides and introduction, and then Dr. and Mefti and Paolo will be together. Sure. Okay, I think we're on, and uh, I want to uh, welcome all the attendees for this uh, golden opportunity for us. Uh, Professor Yazagil graciously accepted to uh, uh, help us presenting uh, this webinar, which is focused on uh, the uh, past, present, and future of microneurosurgery. Uh, the picture you see is the Arkansas Neuroscience Institute, which has a background with uh, part of Professor Yazergil's history. And uh, this has started as a vision, which he shared with uh, Dr. Al-Mefti when he moved to Arkansas. And uh, Lil Rock in his presence and uh, the efforts of Professor Al-Mefti is uh, an earthquake that he established in Arkansas. Uh, led to the uh, training of uh, almost a uh, couple thousand neurosurgeons from around the world and led to uh, the uh, resurgence of microneurosurgery. The reason to start and revisit microneurosurgery is um, 50 years ago when Professor Yazagil started microneurosurgery, upon many discussions with him, he was hoping that by now, microneurosurgery has been in a different spot. And unfortunately, there was a lot of efforts to kind of uh, sideline it. And uh, fortunately, there is a resurgence of it. And this is driven by the need, the patient's needs for uh, helping them with a good operation. Uh, the need is there, the pathology is there, and th this is where it comes from. Uh, our institute is, uh, we're honored to have Professor Yazergi's names on it. Uh, it's the MG Yazergi Neurosurgery Research and Education Center. And uh, it also has the, uh, uh, Dr. Al Mefti's. Uh, um, micro neurosurgery laboratory. Uh, this was the vision that they both put together uh, and uh, hopefully this will be a place where uh, in the future people will uh, still uh, value their contribution through it and continue to improve on patient care through it. There are many centers like this that are becoming referrals for uh, education, one of which is where Professor Yazagil is now, where Dr. Toure, Professor Toure has established a great center at Yeditipi University, which is also one of the meccas of microneurosurgery. And, uh, everyone should visit those. This is the Al-Mefti laboratory, which can take up to 50 
participants. Uh, we have courses on regular basis. And again, this is all uh, their vision uh, that led to eventually establishing uh, the center. And this is the Evandro de Oliveira uh, conference room. Professor Evandro is also one of our mentors that he trained several thousand neurosurgeons around the world. And this is his conference room that he shared a lot of his knowledge with us. Ali, so we are not seeing the, the, your an slide. opportunity which Dr. Uh, Krish. Dr. Is Krish, yeah. we are not seeing your slide. We are just yeah. Can you see my slide now? No, we just seeing no. the advertisement. Maybe, maybe unshare the screen and then share one more time. Okay. We want to see that beautiful place you have. It's a, it's a Taj Mahal. There we go. So again, this is the, uh, as I mentioned, the vision that Dr. Al-Mefti and with Professor Yazagil in Arkansas wanted to establish as one of the places for uh, education on microneurosurgery. And uh, this has the M.G. Hazagin Neurosurgical Research and Education Center. And uh, it has an auditorium which is connected with 3D capabilities to the operating room as part of our life surgery courses. And uh, also has the uh, micro neurosurgery laboratory which is named after Professor Al Mefti, and uh, it can take up to 50 people at one time. It's a very busy place. Uh, Dr. Abud is the director of the lab who maintains uh, one of the really uh, most active uh, laboratories uh, with his Abud model. And this is the, the, the Oliveira conference room. Dr. De Oliveira has sent a message to this conference and I will read it later. Uh, he is he's, uh, one of the missing pillars of this uh, gathering. As you all know that he has been suffering with uh, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And uh, in spite of this, he made the effort to send us a message that he wrote with his eye movements on his computer. And I will read it later. So uh, again, he is one of the missing persons here. He's one of the first students of Professor Yazergil. And we are all privileged and honored uh, to have been uh, at one time or another uh, taught by him. Um, this conference is meant to re uh, to bring back the uh, concept of micro neurosurgery and its value, and to look at its past, its present, and the future. So we will start with the talk by Dr. Al Mefti and Paulo. Dr. Al Mefti decided to share this together with Paolo, and it's on the brainstem as a micro neurosurgical territory and to stress the importance of the anatomy and microsurgery 
being wet together. The way we will conduct this uh, seminar is we will start with Dr. Al Mefti, Professor, Professor Al Mefti, and Professor T uh, Kadri, and then we'll follow with uh, Professor Toure's talk, and I will give my talk, and then Professor Yazergil will be giving his talk, after which we'll have a, a question and answer session. So for all the uh, audience, if you can forward your questions a little later, and then we'll hopefully have an exciting discussion and answer as much of your questions as possible. Again, thank you for everyone to participate and to make this moment a special and historic moment. And uh, I will let uh, give the floor to Dr. Al Mefti and Paolo. Gina, you can go ahead. Yeah, you just need to unshare your screen. Yep, there you go. Put them on. Good morning, Professor. It's so great to see you. It's just a thrill to see you and hear you. Dr. Al Mefti, we lost your camera. I lost my camera. I don't know why. But it's okay. You don't need me. You don't need to see me. There we go. There you go. Do you see me now? Yep. All what I see is Dr. Chris. Oh, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Now, uh, can I share my screen? Uh, yes. A, uh, Oh. Uh, professor, <laughs> we decided to give the talk brain stem. It's a microsurgical territory by Yazergil Glue. <laughs> and uh, for the thousand who are listening to us, a glue in Turkish is the sun. So we are the son of Professor Yazergil. Not just Polo and I, but thousands of the people. Not the one who just listening to us, but the one who's been learning from you for 70 years. Because you're our father. You're the father of micro neurosurgery. It's an amazing breakthrough in science and the humanity. And you driven it, you brought it, you advance it to the benefit and transform all the care of all the patients now and in the future. And it transformed everything we do as a neurosurgeon. So Professor, we cannot thank you enough. You are not only the man of the century, neurosurgeon last century, you are the man of many centuries to come. You taught us. So your gospel will remain eternally. And as you could see, I know another Turkish word is Ghazi. It means the conqueror for the one who's his Turkish weak like mine. You made us conquer this space. Maybe going there need a lot more skill and knowledge and courage than even going to the space. Because of you, 
we conquered the brainstem. It's a neurosurgical territory. To the point that uh, Dr. Erkman and I, both of your children, in the middle of the night on the weekend, we could take that little girl to the operating room and remove that big polycytic medullary astrocytoma totally and to cure her. God to cure her would be an instrument. And to take her stitches in the clinic while she looks that good. And our reaward, which is unmatchable, and you probably felt it over and over through your years. That's when she grown up and graduated, she invite you to her graduation ceremony. She did invite us. So here, it's not one polycytic astrocytoma that comes. It's a very common disease. The brain has a very common neurosurgical disease, and that's cavernomas. Nothing else work but surgery. Now, we got to get in there and get the tumor or not the tumor, the lesion out there. And I so many times heard you say, the more you see, the more you know. And the more you know, the more you see. And I maybe want to add to it, the more you know, the more you can do. And so we got to know. And I learned a lot and still learn every moment from Professor Kadri. He got such a mastery on the brain stem. So I'm going to let him go ahead. Paulo, please. Thank you, Professor. Can I can I share my screen? Yeah. Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Yep. Yes. We're, yeah. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. Good morning here in Brazil. Good afternoon in Istanbul. It's a, such an amazing uh, opportunity for me to get together and see again all of you. I'm missing so much the opportunity and the chance to see and get together with my mentors. Once again, Little Rock is the house of all of us, the home of all of us. And so thank you, Dr. Krish, to put together this continuation of the Little Rock Study Center that teach us all over the world. I just took from the wall the picture of the sculpture of the metanoia. That's the change of the mind. And I borrowed that and I'm gonna use as a background of my slides, trying to explain a little bit of the microsurgery and the brainstem. Now we start with Professor Quote, where he was very deep when he said that the whole brainstem, the whole, the whole uh, central nervous system is eloquent, not just an atom. And it was very concerned whenever we, the neurosurgical community, say that some tumors are inoperable. Because whenever we say that, actually, we are not consider our ability and our competence as surgeons. Professor said that, uh, that to get all of this competence, we should go to the lab and train and learn not only the skull base, but also the intrinsic anatomy, the systems, and the vasculature of this very deep structure. It did divide the compartments of the brain, and especially in the brain stem. He point for us mainly three of them: the ventral, the ventral lateral, and the lateral, the dorsal lateral, and the dorsal aspect, and also the central lesions that may incide in this area. Professor teaches 
the main approach was also considered the scope-based approach that later on were mastered by Dr. Ometti. Those approaches will open up the window for us to go through the labyrinth and catch the box, the treasure box of the brainstem inside the brain. But that professor also said to us, to open up this box and explore our treasure, we do need to know deeply the anatomy. And this is one of the things that he did. This is a model that he made by his hand, trying to understand the intrinsic anatomy of the brainstem. But that's not the only key. As he points out in, this, in his book, this very beautiful illustration of the brainstem, the nuclei of the descending fibers, he also placed that the pathological anatomy of the lesion is what we will go on is spread and open up the way for us to treat those lesions. So I start with the point of the brain scan. It's very old portion of the brain where we have the out with the white matter outside and the nuclei inside. We can divide the brain stem in three portions: the mesencephalon, the pons, and the medulla. The mesencephalus, as you know, we can further divide in the cruda, in the tegmentum, and in the tectum of the mesencephalus. The highest part, the division between the mesencephalus and the deencephalus on the surface is the optic tract. And through the pons, we have the mesencephalic pontine sulcus. We, have, we also have the lateral mesencephalic sulcus dividing into anterior and posterior the mesencephalon, in descending fibers and in the ascending fibers. At the level of the anterior portion, the cruise of the mesencephalon, we know that the main fibers of the corticospinal tract is located in the middle. While in the most medial portion, we have the frontal pontine, and the most lateral portion, we have the temporal parietal occipital pontine. They will descend to converge toward the pons. On the medial aspect, in the, the pigmento, we do have a very crowded place where we have the integration of the extra pyramidal system with the cerebellar system, and also we do have. Uh, the relays of the limbic system within the higher portion of the mesencephalon. So this is a very, very, very complicated. And of course, I do not want or I cannot share, uh, 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 intend to explain this whole anatomy in just 20 minutes. But we do have to pay attention at this level, at all the integration that we have between the lower portions of the brain stem and the deencephalon in the cortical areas. Also, within the mesencephalon, we do have the origin of the third nerve from the most posterior part of the tegmentum passing through the nucleus rubus going to the interpeduncular fossa. On the posterior portion, lateral to the lateral mesencephalic circles, we are going to face the laminiscal triangle where the most superficial one is what we call the lateral meniscus, which is mainly auditory system. But also we have the upcoming fibers of the superior cerebellar peduncle. Those we can never forget because we might face motor disturbance if we have injuries on that. And we know that right in the transition between the mesencephalon and the pons is where the fibers of the superior cerebellar triangle will go on across to each level. At the level of the tectum of the surface, we do have the quadrigeminal plate where we can see the superior and inferior collicula. This is a very important place for integration of the visual system. And we do know that there are strong connections also with the deencephalic areas and through the brachial conjunctiva, through the superior brachial and inferior brachial, the connections of the visual system and the auditory system. This is also a very, very difficult area to understand, especially because this is the transition between the deencephalon and the mesencephalon. And we do 
know that there are different connections relaying in the extrapyramidal and the ocular motor nerves uh, on that area. The pons is located between the mesencephalic pontine sulcus above and the cerebellum pontine and the pontus medullary sulcus below. Laterally, we do have the trigeminal nerve as the division of what we call the pons. If on the surface, we may have the transverse, the superficial transverse fibers of the pons, which are mainly fibers coming from the middle cerebellar peduncle. We also have the pontine medullary circles, the origin of the six, seven, and eight nerves on the recess just lateral and above of the olive. So as we know, the main portion of the transverse fibers of the pons are made by the middle cerebellar pedal. And these fibers, they will cross, they will intermeet with the descending fibers of the frontopontine, occipital medullary, and parieto occipital pontine. The entry point of the trigeminal nerve is what divides the descending fibers from the laminiscal ascending fibers. Paulo. So this is very important for us. Paulo. Yes, sir. Your slides, they said, I got a message that they're not moving for some. So if you can, uh, Stop sharing and restart sharing like I have done. I see. Stop your sharing and then share again. Yes, sir. Stop share. And then share again, share screen. It should yeah. be good now. Yes, it should be good now. Should I I have to continue from here, right? I don't know where I stop. Yeah, that's okay. That's that's fine, but there they can hear you, but they couldn't see the, the progression of the slides. Okay. So now it's okay. Yes. So we are in the pons. So the descending fibers of the pons will cross with the transverse fibers of the pons. And we are going to see that as we remove these transverse fibers of the pons, we're going to see that the most superficial ones, mainly in the medial portion, are the frontal pontine, while in the most lateral ones are the temporal, occipital, parietal pontine fibers. There is a space just in front of the entry point of the five nerve also between the five and the seven nerve, that respect these most lateral fibers that will further converge to go towards the pyramid on the surface, anterior surface or ventral surface of the medulla. So we can see here what is so so-called paratrigeminal space. We can see that mainly the fibers that will converge through the pons coming from the mesencephalus toward the pyramids, they are located mainly to the middle of the mesencephalic peduncle. On the other hand, if we think of the ascending sensory fibers, they are posterior to the descending pyramidal tra tracts. So they are posterior to the deep areas or the deep transverse fibers of the middle cerebellar peduncle. And Paulo, this, yes, sir. Paulo, sorry, just I want to mention to some of the audience who are having some glitches, the YouTube is working very well. So if they are having a problem with the Zoom, they can transfer to YouTube so they can see it uh, maybe better. Just an announcement to all the people who may be having problems with the Zoom connection. Okay, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. That's okay, Professor. So that's the medial laminiscus. So we're gonna see that the sandy fibers will pass through the, ball, the, the, the pons between the crossing fibers of the middle cerebellar peduncle. While the ascending fibers, they will go deeper and more posterior, posterior to the all compact fibers of the deep stratum of the middle cerebellar peduncle. 
When you go towards the medulla, we're gonna see that the presence of the olive will make the, the, the division or the entry point of the anterior to it, the hypoglossal nerve and posterior to it, what we call the lower cranial nerves. We're gonna also notice that in the lower portion of the medulla, we're gonna face the depussation of the pyramidal tract. So the middle anterior uh, sulcus, and then we have the medulla, the, the pre-olivary sulcus and the retro-olivary sulcus, just on the top of the medulla, we have the faucet, we have the origin of the seven and eight nerve. And in the foramen secum, superiorly, we do have laterally the origin of the six cranial nerve. The decussation of the pyramidal fibers is the lower portion, the lower port part of the medulla. So this is considered the lower limit of the medulla. Now in the medulla, we do have to know the very important connections of the cerebellar system with the spinal cord through the inferior cerebellar peduncle that come just lateral to the olive. And here we have on the lateral view the descending fibers of the, of the inferior cerebellar peduncle and the ascending fibers of the superior cerebellar peduncle. Now, whenever we want to enter in the fourth ventral, we do have to let, remember the uvulotonsillar approach of Professor Yashagir. But later on, was described as the cerebellum medullary. So whenever we face the fourth ventricle, we do have to remember the homoidal face. We do have to remember the central sulcus or the median sulcus and the limitant sulcus. We know that the fourth ventricle have a superior portion related to the pons and inferior portion related to the medulla. On each side, we have the limited sulcus, and if we follow the limited sulcus, we have two small depressions, the superior fovea and the inferior fovea. On the middle or intermediary portion, laterally is what we call the vestibular area. Superior portion, we do have a small elevation that's the facial cuticula. When you go to the inferior portion, we know that the cuneatus and grassy, they will open up to form the obex posterior limit of the margin different. And then we have three trigons, the hypoglossal trigon, the vagal trigon, and also the area posterior, a very important area related to the respiratory uh, control. Superiorly, we also have another small depression that we call the nucleus of the area or the, the nucleus ceruleus. If we try to open up this deep anatomical structure, we can see the elevation of the facial nerve turning around the, the nuclei of the seeds. This is the related facial follicular. And we know that the gracial and cuneiform, they are just forming here, the lateral portion of the opex, and then they will enter down there and they will do the laminiscal decussation just in front of the nuclei of the hypoglossal nerve and the vagus dorsal nuclei of the vagus. So this is just a glimpse of the box that we have to open. Then we are gonna realize that this box is actually way more complex. And we chose the cavernomas to try to unveil this box. We know that the first cavernoma that was microsurgical resect was made by Professor Yashin. And why did we choose the cavernomas? Because we know that some of the people or some of the radio surgeons, they are trying or they, they are saying that we might have these lesions are very difficult lesions to be accessed that radio surgery would be one of the way to treat these lesions. Here I quote again, Professor Yashardi, when he referred to the late Professor Ladlau Steiner. He said that 
He respects his sincere opinion and advice. So if we go back to Professor Steiner, when he referred to, to the cavernous malformation, in his article from 1998, he said that microsurgery is actually the treat of those lesions. And that the risk of gamma knife appears to be inappropriate for the treatment of cavernous. So as I said, your professor was the first one to microsurgery access these lesions. And he did it through the supracellular transtentorial approach. Once again, innovating the approach to deep lesions of the brain. And as Professor Yashagil said, there is no area in the central nervous system that cannot be proper assessed. And for this, to open up or show us how to open up this box, I do turn the presentation back to Professor Almeida. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Paulo. That's absolutely beautiful. And uh, I, if I may share this. Now, uh, hold on. Can we see one slide you had uh, with the box open and there is uh, some model inside it? Tell us about that model. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we see your yeah. screen. So yeah, this is... yeah, 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 but, but, but yeah, sorry. No, 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 the, the yeah, yeah, the model inside the box. You, you had it, yes, yes. What's inside? What's there? So, this is professor model of the brain stem. He did serial cuts, enlarged the cuts on both sides, he put in the wood, and then he made the by his hand, the connection of the fibers, and also he managed to place the nuclei. So that was a beautiful model. I don't know which year professor did that, but this was really beautiful. And I had the opportunity to take these pictures in Europe. Uh, professor Ture, can we know from Professor Yazerjil when did he make that model? Nineteen fifties. Wow. Fifty-seven, fifty-eight. Okay. Can I share my uh, slide again? Is uh, my screen on? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, can we I... can see. You can see. Now, I want to be sure of one thing here. Okay. So, uh, uh, what you just saw, I hope a lot of people seeing this in a good resolution screen. It's a, a breathtaking picture. Uh, whenever I see any one of those uh, dissection of Professor Kadri, it, it's just a breathtaking. There is nothing more beautiful. But the thing is not, the picture is breathtaking. The knowledge of that anatomy is life-saving. I don't know how many times I called upon Professor Toure and Professor Kadri to come to the operating room to help me with their knowledge of that beautiful anatomy of the brain. And once you understand it, then for me, it became a easy thing. 
cavernomas, which is common, which we're going to see a lot of it in uh, because of the MRI. It needs an approach. Need, we need to open that box uh, Paolo talked about. Uh, we need to navigate in the cistern so we don't go through any brain. Uh, we need to get to it when it comes to the surface. You cannot dig into a normal neural structure. You need to aim to target to where it comes to the surface. And then it has to be totally removed. It's not enough to remove that multi aged clot. You have to remove the live cavernoma. And into doing that, many of them has associated venous angioma that need to be preserved. Is my screen uh, good, Ali, or yeah, I have it's, a... It's very good. I, it's very uh, good. Taking the whole thing, because I have some picture of it. I don't know why. No, it's looking good. I have the participant on it. OK. So he, here an example, a punting cavernomas has an associated venous angiomas. The closest to the surface is here laterally in the pons between the pyramid and the lateral lemniscus. So it's very obvious the road to it is straight in like that. And that's what we call the anterior petrosal. You drill the petrous apex. You cut the tentorium. And here the fifth nerve. And under the five, above the seven, you got an entry right there. We're closer to the surface. And then it entered it, evacuate the hematoma. The hematoma will be multiple aged, some clotted, some old, some new. But that's not the lesion. That's not the operation. That will make the patient the neurological function much better because of the decompression. But for the patient to live forever happy, we need to get to the live cavernomas. And here it is. You could see those small vessels down there. That's what needs to be removed. And all the time, uh, preserving the venous angioma. That's cavernoma that need to be removed. That's the venous angioma need to be preserved. Till you see that nice, clean surface a gliotic of the brain stem. And you could see the approach straight into it. You see it's totally gone. And amazing how well these patients recover from hemiparatic and eye dissociation to a full neurological function. Now, here another one, but this, as you could see on the coronal, it's low, it's below the seven. So the anterior petrosal through the petrous apex will not be the right approach to it. The right approach to it will be the posterior petrosal, the pre sigmoid transtentorial. And here you could see the seven the six, the lower cranial nerve down here, the choroidal plexus, and then we're gonna get the surface of the pons under the seventh nerve, which you're seeing right there. And again, I ask Kadri in which direction I should enter the pons. 
and he wants me to enter the pons parallel to the fibers instead of cutting them. So that will be parallel to the fifth and the seventh nerve. And uh, here you got it. So that's the petrosal. Now here it's on the same level. You see, this is the facial, but this is far away from lateral entry. And you could see it, it's coming to the surface right underneath that fourth ventricle. So in a lesion like this, that it is presenting itself in the floor of the fourth ventricle, yes, the approach to it will be through the fourth ventricle. The lateral approach, it's safer between the uh, pyramids, but you could get into the, here the floor, we are stimulating to define where is the facial colliculus. You could see the little discoloration where the cavernoma was closest to the surface. And we open it along the medial longitudinal fasciculus off the midline, so you don't get the intraocular ophthalmoplegia. Above the nucleus of the seven, which we have identified with the stimulation. Intraoperative monitoring here, it's extremely helpful. And you could follow it till you have totally clean surface and totally removed. And again, it's amazing that these patients, how well they recover after the operation. Now they might have recovered slowly because the hematoma will start to resolve, uh, but it's okay to take the credit for their very good recovery and fast one. Now, but how about this one? If you look at that, Sagittal view, and I'm not seeing it on my screen, but you could see the only thing left of the medulla is the floor of the fourth ventricle. A very little medulla left posteriorly. So you cannot go from the fourth of the fourth ventricle. You cannot go from the back. In this one, one has to come straight midline from the front. And that's what the transcondylar approach has provided us. You can see here vertebral artery here under the vertebral junction right in the midline. Here the pyramid on one side. This is the cavernoma come right at the midline. And because of that, you could enter that cavernoma right between the two pyramids. a uh, totally avoiding the posterior entry of that precious remaining fourth ventricle. Now, and again, one will pursue it to get all of that cavernoma out and be sure that all of it is removed. Otherwise, they will re-bleed again. Now, and uh, uh, here she is. Sorry, that's uh, an old case, so I do not have the really right post-op uh, sagittal view, but it's gone. Now, this one, it's very obvious where it is. It is on the side. You cannot go from the front or the back. In the side ventrally. So again, here where the transcondylar approach become uh, the way to go. And here it is. You could see we are under the thin nerve. 
going around it. You gotta get that all out, the live cavernomas, the vessels. And that, you know that you did that when you reach to a gliotic plane surface between the lesion and the brainstem itself. You could see it. You see the gliotic surface coming. Still, there is more underneath. A, a skull base. It's a the the mother of microsurgery. It take you safely. Hold your hand and take you safely to where you want to go. So the skill is the microsurgery of what to do inside that precious box. But it helps a lot if you open the box wide open in the right way. And I think that combination led to be able to re totally remove curatively these lesions and have improved patient, not just intact patient but improved patient Try to look up again. here this is obvious you can't look up she has a conversion spasm she accommodate but not react with the pupil so she had something at the quadrigeminal plate and sure indeed has this lesion at the quadrigeminal plate and you could see it right in there, but look down here, a huge venous angioma is, and it's not an AVM, it's cavernomas with associated venous angioma that need to be preserved. So the entry of this is so tiny little window to avoid any injury to the venous angioma or to the vein of gallon that is going or coming to it. What I'm saying, you gotta be so gentle, being able to pull out things from very small opening and notice. And it's gone. Look, uh, look way up for me, uh, look down, look to the left. Look to the right. And again, it's amazing how well they recover and fast. Now, then this is another one. Here it is, the cavernomas and the things. We know how to do that. And obviously, the best approach uh, is to get on that supracerebellar lateral, like Professor Yazergil described it. Dr. al -Mafti. Yes, sir. Can I give you five minutes warning. Uh, I, I'm going to be uh, two minutes. Okay. I'm finished. Anyhow, you could see the entry in it. Uh, the surgeon here, another Al Mifti. And we did good job. But look what happened. At night, we went back. We cleaned it well. Here's the pathology. It's not cavernomas. It's a full AVM. And AVM bleed postoperatively. And one has to be very aware of AVM in that area. Another problem, this one received radio surgery before. You operate on radiator brain stem, you do not get recovery. The two questions left with me, what to do with patients like this, which has 
two separate lesion. They're both symptomatic, cannot be approached in one approach. And the most troublesome one and need a lot of wisdom is the familial form, which has- oh, There are symptoms. very few. Now, professor, 15 years ago, more than 2,500 neurosurgeons gathered in first week of July to celebrate July 6th, your birthday. And now there is a thousand and thousand also on this webinar, wish you happy birthday. And I cannot say it better than what Professor Ed Law said that day to you. So I hope everybody will listen. There are very few people who ever live to have the opportunity to create a true revolution in science, to change the paradigm in such a way that everything is new and everything is fresh and that some of the old challenges are completely eradicated, and some of the new challenges are things that we never would have dreamed of. And this is what Professor Yashigal, you have created for us. A scientific revolution, a new paradigm, not only in neurosurgery, and I've heard you speak about this, but in the concept that goes with it, micro technique, the whole concept of understanding the anatomy of the brain in a, in a new way that makes it approachable for us to deal with things that we never dreamed would be in the province of our beloved field of neurosurgery. We all love neurosurgery. We love being neurosurgeons. And what you have given us is something beyond that something to truly treasure and God willing to further improve upon in our small way. Okay, Ali, thank you. Professor, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the mankind, for what you have brought and taught. Okay, Ali, you're taking over. Dr. Chris. Yes, sir. Take over me, I'm yes. out. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al-Mefti. And to be exact, the number of attendees between the uh, our session and the YouTube and the, uh, uh, the Chinese link is about 3,000 people. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Ye uh, Professor uh, Toure, and I will quote uh, uh, Professor De Oliveira, who uh, I will read his note later. Uh, he describes uh, Ugur as the best fellow of Professor Yazergil ever. So uh, Dr. Toure has uh, taken the most from Professor Yazergil, and he is very lucky. I'm always jealous from him because he has Professor Yazergil next to him every day. And uh, his uh, knowledge of the anatomy and what he acquired has uh, really made his surgery uh, something uh, beautiful to watch. And there's much more to come from him, I'm sure, in the future. And he also established a an amazing setting that uh, we we like to look at it as the twins of micro neurosurgery centers here in Little Rock and in uh, Istanbul. So, uh, to Uger, you're you're on. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Krist and uh, Professor Yashargil, Professor El Mefti, Professor Krist. Professor Kadri and Professor De Oliveira and dear friends, colleagues, uh, it's great pleasure and honor for me to be part of this uh, historical webinar. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, 
especially today, we were planning to do future of micro neurosurgery and neuroanesthesiology congress in Istanbul. And because of coronavirus uh, problem, we postponed it uh, to next year. And I am, uh, I would like to announce here now that we look forward to have all of you uh, next year in Istanbul. And my talk about the micro neurosurgical removal of uh, thalamic lesions. And thalamus is part of the diencephalon and consists of two interconnected ovoid uh, nuclear uh, masses connected with the telencephalon cranially and with the mesencephalon, rhombencephalon, and medulla spinalis, sp spinalis caudally. And it is in the center of the uh, brain. And it's commonly regarded as a gateway for all inputs directly to the telencephalon, and it plays an important role for somatic, vegetative, and cognitive functions. It may be speculated that the little knowledge of the region and difficulty to surgical approaches are the responsible for the conservative attitude generally shown in the neurosurgical community toward the uh, thalamic lesions. Thalamic lesions are deep-seated, real deep-seated lesions, and, but majority of these lesions are focal at diagnosis and amenable for surgical resection. Surgical treatment is still challenging because of the deep location, complex vascular anatomy, and proximity of the internal capsule. But uh, I had first time I saw thalamic surgery in 1990 in Zurich. And then I had an interest with this uh, region. And I am really one of the luckiest neurosurgeon because from now, uh, 1990s to 2020, 30 years, I, am, uh, I, am, I have a chance to work with Professor Yashargil and he uh, gave me courage to do this uh, surgery. And most of the cases, what I operated, he was just behind me and he was watching me. He was giving me ideas and he's discussing with me. And I would like to thank to him to not only his help to me, his help to my patients. And this is the, his classification of growth patterns of thalamic tumors. But what we know, the thalamic tumors do not invade the internal capsule, thalamic gliomas not invade the internal capsule, and thalamic gliomas not invade the hypothalamus. This is the key of the uh, success of thalamic uh, tumor surgery. The main syndromes of thalamic uh, tumors are the raised intracranial pressure and uh, motor deficit, sensory syndrome, involuntary movements, and seizures. Surgical approaches. First of all, we have to forget the lateral approaches because the, the lateral part of the thalamus is corona radiata and internal capsule. So we should forget it. And we should imagine the whole internal capsule and uh, corona radiata in the lateral part. And the same, in the coronal picture, you can see, forget to approach to thalamus from lateral. We can approach to thalamus from transcarlosal or totally transcisternally. And this is the beautiful dissection of uh, Dr. Uh, Carlos Serra uh, from Zurich. And we publish article together to describe four surgical surfaces of the thalamus. As I told you, forget the lateral part, but we have ventricular part and cisternal part of the vent, uh, thalamus that we can do surgery. First one is lateral ventricular surface here between choroid plexus and the um, caudate nucleus. This is lateral ventricular surface of thalamus. We can reach thalamus from here. Second one is the velar surface in, under the velum interpositum. If you mobilize the uh, fornix, you can reach the velar surface. The another one is the cisternal surface. The pulvinar is totally cisternal pulvinar of thalamus. And most of the lesions in the thalamus is located in the pulvinar. 
And the fourth one is the third ventricular surface. This is green one. So we have to keep this picture in our mind and any thalamic lesion, we should choose our approach through these surfaces. And we published this uh, classification uh, three years ago. Now, I would like to share with you with my uh, experience with the uh, thalamic surgery last 15 years. And I like to demonstrate single case for each approach. We have four approaches to thalamus. First one is the anterior transcallosal approach. This is the only you need to do callosal, small callosal incision. The other three approaches, you don't need to cut anything. Second one is the posterior interhemispheric transtentorial subsubcranial approach. Third one is perimedian supracerebellar transtentorial approach. And last one is the perimedian contralateral supracerebellar suprapineal approach. Anterior interhemispheric transcallosal approach, we can use the lateral ventricular surface of the thalamus. So we can go directly to thalamus through this approach. We need just small callosal incision. This is the sample of case. Left is left always in my slides, which I learned again from Professor Yashagi. So one week history of severe headache, double vision and vomiting. This is large left thalamus glioma. Look at this, internal capsule is always intact. And hypothalamus is always intact. But this tumor can go down, herniate to also the posterior fossa. Anyway, this is, I think, very suitable case for transcallosal approach because it's the lateral ventricular surface of the thalamus is tumor. So if we do transcallosal incision from here, of course, we have to choose the direction, not go this way. We have to go this way. And then to reach the surface of the thalamus. And again, internal capsule is always separated by the tumor. And we have to choose our approach. We have to check the, uh, this is sagittal bridging vein. So I can go more anterior than coronal, uh, coronal suture. And this is the vein which we do. So this, this, this is enough space for me. So we can go down to see the corpus callosum. Very important point for me to choose the callosal incision site. So because I have to find the correct angle to reach the tumor. And the cotonoid is the best navigation for me. Cotonoid guided ultrasonography. Which again, I learned from uh, Professor Yashargil and Professor Yash Krisht, Professor Yashargil and I learned from him. This is cotton, this is tumor, and this is correct angle. So this is left-sided tumor. I always use right-sided craniotomy. I go contralateral, left side. So this is left side ventricle through the right-sided craniotomy. I check with endoscope that I have to see anatomy. I have to know that exactly I am in correct place. This is tumor, you see? This is left caudate, ca uh, choroid plexus, fornix, left thalamus. This is the ventricular surface of thalamus, left thalamus. So this is the uh, approach that I can uh, go, uh, go through the tumor. And then you see this is choroid plexus. This is left fornix. I cut the choroid plexus to gain the space. And then just underneath is the tumor. So just separate the choroidal fissure and go inside of the tumor, stay within the tumor. We are lucky that thalamus arterial vascularization is totally different than internal capsule arterial vascularization. This is the, we are lucky that we can remove thalamus tumor without injuring the vascularity of the internal capsule. Just go inside of the tumor and debulk the tumor. When we debulk the tumor, we have space. I do not coagulate when I am debulking the tumor because uh, 
most of them are stopping later on. And then now I can see more. This is now I can see more posterior part. And again, there are big part of tumor is full of tumor is here. I am going posterior part again, touching the tumor and the sucking tumor and feeling tumor. And then I am taking some piece for the uh, histopathology. And uh, this is a curved uh, suction tube. I am removing the tumor underneath the fornix, left fornix. And you see, this is the post, uh, posterior part. There is still tumor. And the beauty of anterior transcalosal approach, I can see the anatomy well. And I can see the whole uh, uh, navigation, uh, navigated spaces. And I remove more choroid plexus to have more space. And I am separating from the fornix and removing the tumor. And now I go more anter anterior. This is anterior part. So this is foramen of Monroe. This is, you see, left foramen of Monroe. Tumor is now uh, herniating from here. This is anterior limit of the tumor. And then hypothalamus is coming. I put a cotonoid. This is my anterior limit of tumor. And then now I go more anteriorly. This is the advantage. This is now uh, I'm opening the septum pellicidum. And then now this is the uh, foramen mondo again. And you see, sorry, sorry. This is third ventriculostomy. I, I'm sorry, just one second. I do microsurgical third ventriculostomy when I use transcalosal approach. This is the because of the biggest problem after tumor uh, thalamus tumor surgery, we may have a CSF problem. So uh, when we perform third ventriculostomy through the foramen of Monroe, we are safe. And then I remove more anterior part of the tumor. This is almost end of the surgery. And I preserve the bridging vein. And this is, you see again, the ultrasonography. This is Carlos, and this is the tumor cavity. And this is preoperative tumor. And this is intraoperative ultrasound tumor cavity. And this is end of surgery without retraction. And this is after resection. You see, it was like a, everywhere was tumor, but you see there are still uh, normal thalamus here. And this is my entrance. And this is go directly to the left thalamus through the anterior transcalosal approach and the sensory and motor fibers are normal after surgery and it was anaplastic astrocytoma. Another case, posterior interhemispheric transtentorial subsplenial approach. This is now I was using in lateral position and now last three years I am using in front oblique position because of intraoperative MRI. Uh, this is the advantage of this approach. We can use intraoperative MRI, go through the uh, parallel to cuneus, and then just under the splenium, we can reach the pulvinar. And then we can go inside of the tumor and totally cisternal approach to go to uh, pulvinar tumor. This is one sample. Again, this is left side of tumor, pulvinar tumor. And in coronal picture and sagittal picture. Sagittal picture is very critical for my decision because this case, you can use supracerebellar approach or posterior interhemispheric approach. This case is suitable for both approaches. But because of intraoperative MRI, advantage of intraoperative MRI, I use posterior interhemispheric approach for this case because in, I can perform it in prone oblique position, and then I can check with the intraoperative MRI. Some words about intraoperative MRI. I have all of them. I don't use neuronavigation in thalamus. 
I don't trust neural navigation. I trust intraoperative ultrasound as a real time navigation. And then intraoperative MRI, it's nice to have to check, is there any residue? There are uh, some issue that they are comparing intraoperative MRI with intraoperative ultrasound. We cannot compare. They are not same, they are totally different. One of them is car, one of them is airplane. Okay, which one is important? Both are important. They are different. I need my car to go to hospital every day, but I need airplane to go somewhere else. Anyway, in these corona days, I cannot go. But for me, the most intraoperative ultrasound is much more better, important than intraoperative MRI. If you have both, it's great. But if you have to choose one of them, I recommend to use intraoperative ultrasonography. So this is intraoperative MRI. It looks nice. And three months later, this is pulvinar tumor using posterior interim sphering sub-CPNL approach. And to go from here to remove tumor without touching anything. And it was grade two astrocytoma. And we published this approach. And then the third one is the perimedian supracerebellar transtentorial approach. This is important. I use midline incision, but perimedian approach, I, which I learned again, Professor Yashagil, I never use midline approach to supracerebellar because there are veins. The most important veins are here. We have to preserve them. Another point is the tentorial angle. In, especially in Turkish people, if you go from midline, you cannot see the pineal. You have to go lateral, so a little lateral. So this is perimedian supracerebellar transtentorial approach to, to reach the pulvinar again. You can reach the same point that uh, posterior interhemispheric approach can reach. This is again cisternal surface of the thalamus. You can reach through the, this approach. This is important. This is left side again. This is splenium and this is tumor. This is the most important issue. I cannot use posterior interhemispheric approach to remove this part, tumor. So tumor is totally hidden by splenium. I never cut splenium. So this is excellent case for perimedian supracerebellar transtentorial approach. Only one disadvantage of this approach is the semi-sitting position I have to use. And semi-sitting position, I love it. This is not disadvantage. I cannot do use intraoperative MRI. This is the problem for me. So, but this is the case that I can only use uh, this approach. Why not transcallosal? Transcallosal also maybe, but if the ventricle is very small, transcallosal approach is not great. So this is another issue. So this is excellent case to go supracerebellar transtentorial. You can reach the tumor in, the, uh, in two minutes without cutting anything. A, a semi-sitting position and release CSF from the cisterna magna. And then this is, I love to preserve this. And this is the uh, left perimedian uh, opening. And then the relaxed cerebellum with the gravity, no retraction. And venous lake and bridging vein, we have to be careful. And this is our place here to go. And then we have to cut the tentorium at the uh, in hiatus. And this is galenic venous system. And cut the tentorium perpendicular to hiatus. Here we have to mobilize the uh, basal vein of Rosenthal, and this is pulvinar here. This is tumor, and this is posterior cerebral artery, and tumor in the surface. And just go inside of the tumor and remove it. Grade two astrocytomas are more difficult because the Thalamus itself looks like a grade two astrocytoma. So the border of the tumor to 
understand is not easy. Glioblastoma is uh, easier than uh, great two astrocytomas in uh, thalamus. And again, the same concept to do internal decompression and fill the tumor. And this is histopathological specimen. And the medial side is the ventricle. And I'm trying to fill the tumor and trying to find the border of the tumor. And suction and the uh, bipolar is the best tool for me. I can use CUSA. If I prepare the big piece for tumor, I can use the CUSA. Otherwise, suction and the bipolar, uh, I have feeling. And now I use the CUSA. I know that piece is tumor. Now I, I can see the ventricle. You see the fornix, bilateral fornix, upper part of, of the tumor. So I reach the ventricle, lateral ventricle. And I'm checking with endoscope. This is tentorium, tentorialization, galenic venous system. And this was my uh, pulvinar was here. So I go through the pulvinar. And now this is the beauty of endoscope. Because you see, there is residual tumor here that which I couldn't see with the microscope. So I go there again to remove the residual part. So again, I am checking. This is intact tentorial bridging veins. And going there. And this is the advantage of semi sitting position. I know some people are using lateral or prone position for this, but, and this is fornix bilateral. And this is right thalamus. Yeah. Okay. And this is after surgery. You see, this is my direction to go to left pulvinar tumor. It was sensory and motor fibers are normal, and it was low grade astros oligoastrocytoma. The last approach is the same incision, same craniotomy, but just contralateral, but supracerebellar and suprapineal. Not for, I know that this approach described for pulvinar, but I use this approach for not for pulvinar. I use this approach to go to third ventricle surface of the uh, thalamus. Third ventricular surface of thalamus, I think this is the best approach. And this is the case. You see, tumor is in the third ventricle surface. And I don't prefer to go transcallosal, transparoidal, and there is normal tissue here. And so the best way for me to go to contralateral perimedian approach. This is sensory and motor fibers are normal. So this is the approach, the same direction, but not pulvinar. Go find the pineal and go inside of the ventricle. The, again, the left side, bridging ways, I mobilize them, I don't coagulate them. Again, the, uh, because of the gravity, cerebellum, and now the system, uh, quadrigeminal system, I open it. And the pineal gland, we have to find, you see, this is the pineal gland. And we have to go superior than pineal gland. Yeah, here is the pineal gland. And I cut the arachnoid. And here is the ventricle. And here is the tumor. And this is the endoscopic view. Contour lateral, suprapineal approach. This is uh, court nerve, tectum, pineal gland, go upper then. And this is the choroid plexus of third ventricle. And here is the tumor and bilateral foramen of Monroe. 
this is the tumor. I think this is the only way to get this tumor, to reach this tumor through this approach. And this, I am taking peace for uh, histopathology. And I have now four cases, the same case, and four of them are benign tumor. This is interesting. Pulvinar tumors are mostly malignant, but third ventricle tumors are all of them. I have four cases, all of them are uh, low grade. I don't want to tell benign, sorry, low grade. So we find the border. Okay, my timer is uh, running now. I don't, I want to be on time and just to check, to remove it and it looks nice, but I am checking with endoscope. You see, there is residual tumor here. You see, this is the, again, the advantage of uh, endoscope. There is residual tumor that I can see with the endoscope and I use uh, curve suction and bipolar to remove that. And this is the last piece. Yeah, okay. Now this is the end of uh, postoperative MRI and it was a low-grade tumor, glenar tumor, no problem. And we published this approach. And I operated 92 patients in last uh, 12 years, 92 patients, and most of them are adult patients. I use four approaches only, mostly anterior transcalosal and this. I now prefer these approaches more because of the advantage of intraoperative MRI but I love these both approaches. And now I have four cases instead of three, but uh, this is only for the third ventricle surface of the uh, thalamus, this approach. And then I operated, some cases I operated two times, three times because of the high grade tumors. And I use, uh, th these are the whole histopathology, mostly gliomas and unfortunately mostly uh, high grade gliomas. And I have no surgical mortality, one major sur uh, surgical morbidity due to CSF problem. The, even patient wake up very well the, with the CSF problem. We had a many, many CSF uh, surgery and the patient unfortunately did not well. Uh, CSF circulation problem in seven patients we had. And and high-grade gliomas. This is, we have to keep in our mind. So for this reason, I performed the microsurgical uh, third ventriculostomy. And most of the patients are same or better than preoperative period. And microneurosurgery allows safe removal of thalamic lesions with acceptable risk of morbidity. Individual patient has to tailor and for surgical planning, neuroimaging is essential. And we have to understand the exact point of the uh, growing pattern of the tumor or lesion. And radical resection should be goal for uh, high grade or low grade tumors. And high grade glioma patient may have CSF problem. We have to be careful about this and anterior interim spheric approach could be uh, one of the first choice. And prognosis of depend of mainly for uh, resection uh, amount and the tumor type. Of course, adjuvant therapy should be utilized depending on histopathology. I like to show this slide that in the modern era, we have many toys now and I love them and I have all of them, but they are not enough. And this is the, not the answer of uh, surgery, success of surgery. This can help us, but we need to have real, we have to put this information together with the, our anatomical knowledge, our correct indication, surgical approach and microneurosurgical technique. And we need all of them. 
And of course, this is not my work alone. I'm working with Professor Yashargil and I'm with the excellent team and I'd like to thank all of them. Thank you, Dr. Krish. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ture. Beautiful presentation. And I was mistaken earlier. I said there was about 3,000 uh, who are attending. We have about 5,000 people who are attending in between the different uh, connections. Uh, I will go forward with my presentation now. I'm very yeah, eager. Just, to, yes. I like to show, mention that this uh, work is just accepted in Journal of Neurosurgery, so they can read in detail this series. Great. Thank you. Great. OK, uh, Gina, can you share my screen? Um, I spotlighted you, so just click share screen at the bottom. We can see it. That's great. Okay. So as uh, was mentioned before, the value of micro neurosurgery is, is in uh, the last slide that Professor Turi showed, we have to master the anatomy and master the approaches and decide what's the best approach. But one of the things that uh, Professor El Mefti and, and Professor Kadri mentioned is what Professor Yazagil gave us is the courage to go places where uh, normally we did not feel comfortable doing because he was kind of leading in this aspect of it. And that applies to the cavernous sinus area. And a lot of things that I do, especially approaching the basilar aneurysms through the cavernous sinus was due to his encouragement and uh, kind of pushing us and pushing me uh, that this is really a, a good approach that can provide more advantages. Along the same line, I was lucky to be around uh, Dr. Al Mefti, who's been living in and out of the cavernous sinus on a daily basis. So this was a good combination for me to satisfy my deep interest in this region and help develop some of the, um, you know, steps to enhance retreating these tumors. But I like to mention an approach that I have done, which was to, uh, to get to the region of the uh, cavernous sinus, the way it was approached uh, by Professor Yazagil with insular gliomas. Because if you think about it, these are lesions which were considered non-operable for a while. And uh, he was able to provide a way to operate on them. And this came from in-depth knowledge of the anatomy to where this knowledge was applied with the knowledge of the surgical anatomy and what were the risks. And then eventually led to him, you know, guiding us to being able to operate on those safely. This transition from an unoperable to an operable has many criteria and that trend should come back instead of a very strong popular trend nowadays is to shy away from micro neurosurgery. And for the young people who are involved with micro neuros with neurosurgery in general, uh, a lot of times they're being forced to conform to something that is not going to be helpful to a lot of patients. So. We're giving them a passive mind that a lot of times we kind of end up regurgitating familiar information instead of being creative and to actively think how to digest and uh, the information and come up with new and original ideas so that uh, we're not just consuming things. And I like to quote this because this is how surgery in the cavernous sinus can be looked at, just like how Michelangelo looked at it. He said, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. 
This is one way just to look at how we do our surgery. And in the cavernous sinus, it applies most because in those cases, you have to be able to see the pathology with a different eye. Professor Yazagil always used to talk about the, the brain eye. And that's one way where when you get acquired a certain amount of knowledge, you're able to see things in a different way. So microneurosurgery is, is a process that evolves to a moment which you have to assume a certain character and have a certain attitude. And it's a lifetime commitment and not just a step that you do and you expect that this will lead to a certain progress. You have to recognize that mastery and excellence really starts by mastering the basics. And in this case, it's anatomy. You saw how uh, Dr. al Mefti, when I asked him to give his talk, he wanted to combine it with the beautiful work of Dr. Uh, Kadri because of the essential aspect of the anatomy for him to show how you can achieve those better results in a way. So in the cavernous sinus, the knowledge of the anatomy should be very enhanced and expanded. Uh, you cannot know it in a very shallow way. You should know the whole extension of the anatomy from where it starts to where it ends. And then you can understand the pathology and how and where these tumors or approaches have to be done in order to make it more clear. So understanding anatomy leads to understanding pathology and understanding anatomy also leads to understanding the physiology of how things work. And we have to get that depth of anatomy. So coming to the cavernous sinus, and I'm gonna take an example of meningiomas, knowing where these tumors grow from is essential because you have to reverse the growth of these lesions. And they start in this area in my humble opinion, and then they spread out and to a different extent, and that's how they present. There are, there's a lot of hodgepodge of, of uh, literature, and this is, shows you one of the publications, uh, which has a big mistake in the picture depiction because they have the nerves inside the tumor, and that's not really a good understanding of of the anatomy of these lesions. These nerves are all on the outside except the sixth nerve. And if we start with the wrong assumption, we're gonna do the wrong operation. And then we end up with results like this. These are like patients that I see frequently with significant problems. By the time I see them, they've already lost vision and lost all the functions and they've been radiated and treated so many ways and uh, you can see the only thing missing here is the temporal lobe and not the tumor. Uh, the surgery is easy now because everything has already been damaged, but unfortunately the, the morbidity is already decided. So doing these incomplete jobs, which led to failure, uh, we should take those as a part of our incentive to a success. Failure is not the opposite of success. If we failed before, we shouldn't just say, you should never operate in the cavernous sinus and that's it. So if we look at this uh, depiction of the anatomy of the pathology, and these tumors start in this corner and they grow in the cavernous sinus towards Meckel's cave. And the proof to that is in front of us because this is a small tumor and that's how it looks when it gets larger and extends. You can see the extension of the tumor in a different case. And then they start going under the nerves, except for the sixth nerve, which is buried inside, and they extend in different way. And this observation is what I alluded to earlier, very much like, like how professor looked at the gliomas and decided with knowledge of anatomy, knowledge of the clinical findings that these should be operable. And in the same way, these should be operable as well. However, the approach should be different. We shouldn't go into them with the lack of knowledge, then it, it, it will look complex instead of simple and our ignorance will portray it as a difficult area. So we have to approach it in a sense of 
going in and dissecting the nerves, very much like what we do in peripheral nerve surgery. In peripheral nerves, we go to where normal is, and the normal here is in the superior orbital fissure region and in the brainstem. And then the tumor is in between. So you find where normal nerves are and you bridge them. So the surgery is no more an operation which is done on the tumor itself, but the operation is done on the nerves. You just dissect the normal anatomy because you have an in-depth knowledge of it and delineate it out. And we start usually with the fourth nerve and this is unlocking the whole cavernous sinus to see the anatomy. We get the fourth nerve out, the third nerve, V1, V2, V3. And the sixth nerve is the last to be dissected within the uh, uh, depth of the, of the uh, sinus. So once you delineate the nerves extradurally, then you bridge them intradurally. You can see the nerves intradurally going from outside to in and then unlocking all this region will open up the space that leads to the extension intradurally that you see the tumor here. And then the surgery is, becomes in a space which is free of nerves. And by delineating those nerves and bringing them out, and it's no more tumor surgery, it's delineation of anatomy surgery, just like what you see here and this is what saves those nerves. Dissecting the nerves in the proper way, it will allow their preservation and their full recovery in almost every patient. So this idea that cavernous sinus is morbid and you shouldn't do it and so on, if you do it the wrong way, it's gonna be morbid. If you do it the right way, it's not gonna be morbid. By the time we finish in all these cases, you will see the anatomy displayed this is removal of the bone of the petroclival junction. And at the end of every operation, you have a very enhanced view of the whole anatomy where it's displayed. And you can see the brainstem, the basilar, third nerve, et cetera. All this view is repeated on every case. It doesn't matter if the tumor is big or small. It is the same result because the approach became the same. Even the time of surgery becomes the same as well. You can see the anatomy clearly in all these lesions. So a bigger tumor like this, the results will be the same. It's the difference is you cut bigger tumors pieces in between the different uh, nerves that you dissected. So this is finishing the extradural part delineating where the carotid and all the pathology is, and then you open the intradural. This is a simulation in the lab, just to stress the point that this is all anatomy. If you learn the anatomy, you'll be able to apply it very well and very clearly. And this is cutting the, the area where the tumor is living. These tumors live in the, folk, in the, in the folds of the tentorium and in that corner of the cavernous size. That's why I like to really changed their name and called them cavernotentorial meningiomas. They're different than all other tumors. Now, in this case, you will see that at the end, the result is the same, the view is the same, and the anatomy is displayed, uh, all preserved, uh, because the, the way we approach them is, is in a different way than, than what we used to approach them before. And this is the patient Afterward, yeah, and you can see that no. they have full uh, eye movement. This no. is immediately post-operatively. And the reason is no the dissection is done on the nerves and not uh, on the tumor. Six nerve is a tricky one, but more recently, the trick to dissecting it is really to remove the petrous apex because you can see how tight it is. There are landmarks. Uh, we don't have time to describe them. We will be talking more about them in different sessions. But once you get the, the petrous apex, then the sixth nerve is freed, then the dissection all the way to the brainstem becomes possible, just like decompressing the optic nerve by removing the, uh, the uh, clinoid. So this is cutting, we will cut the fifth nerve to show you the sixth nerve, how it is dissected. 
And in a case like this, where the patient presented with this large tumor and a six nerve palsy, this is a more recent one. You can see that in this case, the results towards the end, few, three, two to three months later. And this to me is a big plus, uh, really a breakthrough case because we were able to bring back the six nerve functions and remove the tumor almost totally like you have seen. So, and these patients do very well. They're all have preserved functions. And this is the results of our cases. In the last 24 cases that I've done in the last two to three years, cavernotentorial meningiomas, patients 24, there's really no permanent deficits new in the third nerve. And the same with the sixth nerve, the sixth nerve, however, if it is damaged, the recovery is less likely. But since the last cases we have done, it is encouraging that the new technique will improve on those patients. We'll see how the future shows. The fourth nerve usually recovers. Although I have one patient that I repaired it, it was cut in the case, and the patient did very well. I'm not sure if this is a recovery or is an adjustment. What's Unfortunate, more recently, that cases like this in the region of the cavernous sinus have, are being approached endoscopically, which is really sad because there are more complications or using two to three approaches and so on. This is a schwannoma on a patient that should be approached using the route of the cavernous sinus because this route really gives you a panoramic view of that region and then you don't have to be sacrificing. There is even a case I have seen on YouTube that the surgeon puts it as a good way to do it. And he shows how he cuts two big fascicles, which end up cutting the whole nerve and saying this was all involved with tumor. This is a very poor understanding of the anatomy, but this is to show how one approach by delineating all these nerves and unlocking Meckel's cave. You can see the fourth nerve, the third nerve, and this is the tumor filling all this region. This is the fourth nerve in the leaflets of the uh, tentorium. And as we open up this region, you will see I identify the sixth nerve. This is a petroclival ligament, which should not be involved with tumor. It's on the side of it. And all these areas have to be delineated before you attack the tumor. Then you know the whole anatomy. This is the fifth nerve. You can see the tumor inside Meckel's cave and then the tumor next to the brainstem. But look at this panoramic view of this region. And now we are cutting the tentorium to unlock the whole space. And now you can see that this has flattened all the nerves so that anywhere you go in on top of it, you're gonna damage nerves. The way you preserve them 100%, you go on the side, you find where the tumor is, and then you start debulking. And the real picture of the tumor is like this. You have fibers which are above and below, and the tumor is living between them. And then by the time you remove the last piece of the tumor, then you are looking at the brainstem. You have the nerves completely preserved in here. And you can see the nerve completely preserved. And that's the brainstem. And it's a view that you have not damaged anything, any fascicle of the nerve as well. And you can see how the advantage you're operating under the brain and there's a, a retractor that contours with the subtemporal region. This is the, the basilar and all its exposure that you can see. And that's the post-op of this 20 years old lady. So you can extrapolate this to other tumors. Invasive pituitary adenoma can be operated on. It is true that endoscopically you can remove of this tumor, but the advantages is when you can cure patients like this patient with ACTH tumor, this is a, to me as another breakthrough case because this is a patient who failed surgery and was going to be given radiation, has been on medication and there is no evidence of tumor on the MRI. So this case, we know that there is tumor 
and we did Petroza sinus sampling and it's on the left side. So in this case, we are gonna go and just, because we know how to explore the whole cavernous sinus region, we know where these tumors hide because this is the anatomy that we expose. That's the tumor hiding behind the posterior part of the intracavernous carotid. This is the normal gland, pituitary gland. And that tumor cannot hide anymore from this approach. This patient would have spent a whole life of morbidity and problems because they cannot get a cure. And this patient is heading to the cure. And that you can see the space where the tumor was hiding and we were able to remove it and clean it. This is where the tumor is hiding in this area. And again, this is a big advantage because we are really tackling the bad morbidity and physiology of these patients. And that's the advantage of knowing the anatomy, knowing the anatomy of the pathology and being able to preserve them. And these patients have full functions immediately post-op if you know how to dissect these nerves properly. I come to the basilar and I will go through it fast, but I want to give the big credit for the encouragement and the push that Dr. that Professor Yazagil gave me. He even last time I, I have seen him, he can in his brain follow the number of cases I have done. Uh, when I visited in Istanbul, he could tell me where he thinks I am. And I am now close to 200 cases using the, the basilar, the, the different transcavernous approaches. And these pay. These aneurysms come back because they have a disadvantage of being hemodynamic stress locations. This is an example of a patient that will fail endovascular therapy. And I want to quote uh, Dr. De Oliveira because he was always also pushing me with these cases. Uh, he always used to say surgery is, uh, is indicated uh, when it's done in a superior level. And he sure is right. He used to give the example of AVMs. We do small AVMs, grade one, because we're comfortable doing them. If we're not comfortable, we think radiation is a better option. So I will take one example here. This is a, an aneurysm, which is a great aneurysm for surgery. The approach we do is a transcavernous approach. This is a, with a pretemporal opening. And this was actually, Professor Yazagil described a modification of the perional approach using a more temporal side to go to the basilar apex. This is taking it one further step into the middle fossa and opening all these uh, uh, connections between the petroclival junction to mobilize the third nerve so you can get a very wide view. And then gradually you enlarge the space by removing the posterior clinoid. You see the third nerve is, mobili is mobilized completely. This is what helps its recovery fully. And then this is a, a technique that was described by Professor Yazagil to cut the uh, posterior communicating artery. So you can get a, a majestic view of the basilar apex. And in here, what you notice, there is a clip on the P1 on the opposite side, there is a clip down on the basilar apex and still the view is, is completely unobstructed. The video of this will show it and I will just speed it up, but this is what you see as you clip the aneurysm. I am looking around, I can see all the perforators and I'll be able to even clean a small perforator off and I'll speed it up because of time. And you can see the view you get at the end by putting the last clip on it. This is readjusting the clips. So the space we created has improved on the safety of these cases. This is the temporary clip on the basilar artery, then, then trying to come back and putting the final clip in a way, and the first one was a pilot clip, and this is the final clip, and seeing all the perforators around without any obstruction. This is the view you see. This is how this case ended up. 
And it's very sad that I get these cases. This is from one of my fellows, Ruben, from, uh, he may be attending from uh, uh, Netherlands. And you can see this case, which is equivalent to the case I just clipped. It is really not fair that these cases are not being treated. This is a meta-analysis. What they say is microsurgical technique remain the most morbid treatment modality with the best rate of complete occlusion and lowest rates of re-hemorrhage and retreatment. So we know this is a superior option long-term, but it's considered most morbid. And I, I disagree with that when proper microsurgery is being done. Otherwise you'll end up with catastrophes like this, like this, like this one with a big stroke in the brainstem. You can see all these problems. This is unfair for these patients. So in, to, to that point, we can do better. These are complex cases all being clipped through using these approaches. And this is a good example, a large aneurysm, which is destined to fail. This is how it looks, very wide base. And when we approached it, and I will show the, closely the final result, this is, the clip being applied on the basilar artery. And then you can see the view of the whole aneurysm and you can see around it. And then you can take your time navigating. And if you use Professor Yazigal technique, which is approaching it as a process, not a step, so that you can put clips on and off and then navigate around. Here we collapse the aneurysm and then we will look around. This the first clip was a pilot clip. Then I'm closing the bleeding spot and then you remove the clip and then you decide afterward on putting your final clip. This is dissecting the aneurysm. Again, this is unfortunately, this was introduced 40 years ago or more by Professor Yazergi, which really provide a great advantage long-term for the patient. It's curing the patient. And it was done by him in the most safe way, but unfortunately this is being looked at as not the best way to be approached. So I will go to my results so that we can go to Professor Yazgo. We can show many examples, but this is, uh, uh, not a recent slide, but it shows 183 complex aneurysm. The outcome in the ruptured cases by three months to a year, 83% are in good shape independent. And the unruptured ones, 95% within one year are doing very well. And we were not able to clip three patients, two of which were coiled aneurysms. We had regrowth only in three and two which were reclipped. The oculomotor nerve has full recovery when it is dissected properly. And I want to go back to the fact that really mastery is when the complex becomes simple. And to do it, you have to put the effort. I'm gonna quote Dr. De Oliveira by finishing the last few slides and introducing uh, the lecture to Professor Yazigil. As you know, Evandro is, uh, suffering from ALS. Uh, this is his criteria of success for a neurosurgeon, having the passion, determination, and courage, and get an inner sense. He, he was really wanting to provide us with some words about the webinar, but he could not. I have the, the golden opportunity of having great teachers, Dr. El Mefti, who I started with, Professor De Oliveira, Professor Dolink, and Professor Hernesnami is one of my vascular teachers as well. And we're all under the umbrella of Microneurosurgical School of Professor Yazigil. And this is a, a picture with Evandro that I learned so much from. And I'm going to show his, uh, his message to us. And he wanted to say more on the webinar but unfortunately he was typing with his eyes on his microscope and he could not, uh, uh, he got tired. So his daughter told me that uh, 
he he mentioned here uh, I'm going to go back to see it. We expected he could have talked a little bit about the webinar theme itself, but as it really difficult and tiring for him to write using his eyes, he decided to talk about you and the other surgeons in this in his uh, message. This is his message. Dear friends and giants of neurosurgery, first of all, I would like to apologize and say that if I could, I would be happy to be with you. However, as you know, my clinical condition does not permit. It's great pleasure to have the opportunity of, in a few words, to try to tell you a little bit about what I feel when I think in each one of you. Professor Yazagil is the one who changed neurosurgery, introducing microneurosurgery in the ends of 1960s, inspired myself and everyone to visualize a new paradigm in our specialty. Thank you, Professor, for changing our lives. Dr. Al-Mefti, the best cranial base surgeon ever. Thanks for keeping us in good balance in face of strength of our different opinions with your balanced approach to all of us and keeping your sense of humor. Ali, I'm very proud to make part of your successful journey. It's difficult to find words to express the role of Ali in neurosurgery and in my personal life. Great surgeon, best friend, a chosen brother. My partner spreading the microneurosurgery all over the four continents. Ture, Yazagil's best fellow ever. You make me feel confident that there is still so much to improve in neurosurgery. And Paolo must be congratulated to be between the giants so early, always dedicating his career to overcome the boundaries of knowledge. Congratulations for you all, giants. Life is so precious. And thank you for making your best to save lives. Monsieur all event. So, why microsurgery is important? It's a must because it's needed. And as professor always uh, inspired me, it has unlimited potential. I would like to, before getting professor to reassure you professor, that there is a parallel universe of microsurgeons who are being developed. So rest assured it will be okay. We were also like uh, Ture said, we were planning to have a meeting of a microneurosurgery community this year, but because of the coronavirus, we could not. So again, we will have an appointment with you next year. So professor, this is the last course we had. It was full of enthusiasm for microsurgery. You are a visionary that you taught me nothing is impossible. And to know our limit, but have no limit. And you put it beautifully in the last session of the World Federation to use judicious courage based on professional competence. It's a great honor to have known you and I will give you the floor and thank you for giving us this opportunity. Gina? Yep, I Can am. Connect with the professor? They just need to turn their video on. Okay. Dr. Ture.
I've, I've requested there. There we go. And um, if you want to unshare your screen, yeah, uh, Deb. There we go. Okay, Professor, you are on. Dear colleagues, Professor Christ, Professor Almekti, for the cadre, for the Ture, and for the law, all participants. We had a very <coughs> impressive two hours. I enjoyed very much to see the advances also the presentation, and you made real great steps. From the Almefti, put my name, Yashar Gil Olu. So you are not my sons. I like to explain to you, if we call Yashar Gil Olu, you are grandson, because Gil, is in the Balkan Turkish Oglu. Oglu, Oglu. <laughs> Just the point. Now, what I am presenting you at my beginning of my lecture, since my youth, especially in high schools and later on all my life, I have been very impressed from the work and publication from Johann Wolfgang von Goethe in Weimar in Jena. He's a great German writer, poet, two well-known famous books, Faust one and two, and many other publication, thousand letters, but <clears throat> he is also a great neurophilosopher, neuroscientist, neuroartist. He painted himself and he was a great collector. What is not well clear explained so I like to devote my lecture to him and to his group. Next picture, please. Who's changing? Next. I put here, Goethe was <laughs> great poet and writer and thinker and same statement, and he make a reform of the university, Jena, and give his great friend, Friedrich von Schiller, another great poet. He was a medical doctor, but he never practiced. So the university Jena is, named to him. And I started there January 19, 
44. And I like to make your attention. Goethe was supporting this university and controlling. And he was also pushing on asking Kerner to make a better optic system, better microscope. Because he was silver, silver interested on many scientific projects. And he, he, I was very impressed in my gymnasium on a paper from him, the metamorphosis of the plants, this for then primordial cells. So he was some way pre-runner of the evolution theory. He was thinking also on the organism, self-organized systems. And he asked Kerner to make a better microscope. And Kerner was pushy Carl Zeiss. Zeiss was very talented mechanics. And then he started in a small hut, still is in the center of science company. And I visited and saw this. And then he was not alone. There was a auto shot. There's a large company factory next to size. They produce best glasses and also not breakable glass and everybody and you used it as children milk glass shot and breakable so he produced glass for size to make a better microscope but great man is the ernst abbe the son of a miner and a but great intelligence, genial person. He is behind the creation of size company. And he is a calculated how to make a, a lens. Before lens had been made by hand grinding. But since that then his calculation it started to be made at serial production. These three persons together with the kernel four persons are stimulated by Goethe. And then one more, Schleiden, he discovered the first plant cell with the membrane plasma and the nucleus and told by a lunch to his friend Schwann and said also this must be same in animals. In Schwann started and found then the cells. <laughs> so the whole story going and then 20 years later this way this happened 18 36, and 20 years later, Virchow came, another great German genial person with the cellular pathology. It started, and then Heckel is uh, admiring Darwin, uh, uh, new Darwinism started with him, all in this Jena school. We have been very fortunate since achromatic, achromatic microscope has been available, so the histology started, and the pathology started to develop, and asepsis, antisepsis, or anesthesia, and this histology, this was the first step. And then we can follow this every 10 years in neurosciences, new developments. And 
think he also advances in mathematics, the scientific te technology developed on medical industry, and we get profit from this. It is a great advances since 1880, every 10 years, every 10 years. And I am witness since 1949 in neurosciences, what's going on. Incredible, fast changing. Next slide, please. Now, the impact of micro neurosurgery. I enjoyed really very much to see the pictures from Almefti and Kadri and then Krish and then Ture, how they do now. I, I'm really very happy to see they made the next steps. They do better than what I can do. Perfect approaches, perfect removals. So the microsurgery created oh, What's happened? Yeah, for sure. Coming. Sorry. Microsurgery created new dimensions for neurosurgical procedure, broadened horizons for neurosurgeon, offering innovative concepts for approaches and for pure, complete elimination of the lesion which occur in distinct segmental units. So mm -hmm. you saw in last two hours, excellent films and excellent post-operative condition of the patient in operated in the areas which have been called inoperable. They are inoperable. Now, the time period is over. What is over? lower concept, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe. Still there are regions. In these regions we have gyral. In gyral system we have segmental units. We have the segmental units also in the encephalon, hypothalamus, thalamus, and then mesencephalon, etc. everywhere. We have to learn this new concept because the lesions are, they have to respect the area because the immune system related to the segmental units. Next slide. Micronological concept, in short, creation of specific transosseous window. Exploration of all the lesions to the subarachnoidal pathway, so-called cisternal navigation, recognition of the phylogenic, ontogenic compartmental anatomy of the CNS and related predilection size of the lesions. Şimdi <gülüyor> We are now in the electronic time period. We have an instant global connections and we can fly now to the moon and got more extra terrestrial. But the system is also very sensitive. Yeah. And we see also our momentum very great problem with the coronavirus. Yeah. It looks and good now, it looks good. The population is in danger. If you, if you press the button that says play from current slide, it will be the full screen. 
One second, one second. Bir saniye hocam. Yeah, looks good. Hold on, Yeah, looks very good. Excellent. Okay, now we got uh, some modern technological difficulties. Sorry. Now, to continue. We saw by presentation, pure lesionectomy is the principle. If we remove the lesions completely, manure the pure lesionectomy without injuring the surrounding normal tissue. It, this means also taking care for the immune system on the surrounding area. This patient has a chance to sur survive longer time. And we have now same by Ture in my series, 5% of glioblastoma surviving 20, 20 years or more years. Nobody can explain what is this. The histology is correct. So it was a glioblastoma. And also anaplastic tumors, they survive longer. And benign tumors, same. Then, Hemostasis is now with the bipolar coagulation technology of Alma. It's perfect. But we don't know, well, many people don't know the possibility of the B ball technique. This was introduced also. Is, uh, 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 Malice. Malice. Huh? Malice. 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 But by Len Malice, this is excellent by hemangioblastomas and by meningiomas. But we unfortunately we lost Malice early. He died. And they don't produce more, but somebody should take the system would produce more. Exploration without rigid brain attraction. Use cotton, soft cotton sponges. Reconstruction of the central and peripheral nerves can be done. Reconstruction of repair brain arteries down to half millimeter, 500 micron, and eventually veins. Reconstruction of PIA arachnoidia membranes and dura, watertight. PIA. Why the PIA? Yeah, if we have to incise the PIA, because just underneath is the lesion, then we leave it open, then we'll give a adhesion to the dura. And this can could create problems and seizures. Arachnoidea in perichiasmatic area, they don't need to be closed. But cisterna magna and spinal cord, arachnoidea membra has to be closed precisely to not, to not have a CSF leakage. Next slide, please. Next slide. We're looking. Okay. Now, I am telling since at least 
30 or more years to my colleagues. Most of them are no more living. I discuss with them, it should be done something. We are everywhere as a different system in the United States. The young people are sent to the biology or other specialties. And then I had to go myself one year in neurology, one year in, in internal medicine, and one year in the general surgery. Okay, it was a profitable. But there was a no training, systematic training in surgical anatomy on hand on surgical techniques. And I, we should make a rule. Each candidate has to spend one year or more to learn craniospinal bones, then the surgery part, how to drill, high speed drill learning. Then meninges, arachnoidal system, cisternas, and then the vasculature, we believe to know. No, we don't know exactly the variation, individual variation. Then parenchymal system. Since now last six years, I'm happily here by Professor Ture, well saved, and I have all support around me, secretary and helpers. We are studying the gyral system. You will now get the next book devoted to the cerebral gyral variations. There are interesting points. You will be surprised. Then naturally the rest, white matter, fiber system, etc., nuclei, and so we have to learn. The people know now at the moment more the encephalon, mesencephalon, and the rhomboencephalon, but I don't like examine the people about the gyra. <laughs> this is important. Ventricular system has to be learned. Then the peripheral, the cranial, spinal, and peripheral nerves, and the section and the suturing possible. And then one must we should adapt, adapt the segmental and compartmental concepts and craniospinal surgical approaches training in the laboratory. Yeah. Next slide, please. Now, this is still not introduced. Nowhere is a systematic one year or the more training in the surgical anatomy and, and manual dexterity in laboratory. Also to get the very informed about the microscope, about ultrasound system, and all these operates are not well trained. Now, just to remember, the systematic neurosurgery started by pioneer neurosurgeon in Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore in this building. And there is a here oh, exercising room, pushing on them, they have been training here. And this is very important. Another room there, oh, Max Brödel, a young man, he was working in Leipzig, Germany, by famous physiologist Ludwig in this team from Johns Hopkins visiting Europe, saw him. They convinced him, hey, come over, come to Baltimore. And he came and he built a center and, and trained 400 young artists. They made a beautiful animated pictures. This is different. At that time, there was a no X-ray, no Röntgen, no CT, no MRI. The picture had been very important. All this book on Cushing, Cushing was himself talented. 
and dandy have been painted for Max Brutal at this group. Next slide. And here's the Max Brutal. The learning experience would be incomplete without self-investigation. The artist must know that his subject so truly that he can shut his eyes and call into existence a mental picture of great clarity, complete in every respect. If you are in the United States visiting Johns Hopkins Hospital, visit his memorial. His, his center is still open. We need these artists still, although we have now movies, etc. but we need artistic, scientific artists. Next slide. Next. It was more or less instinctive. I decided to go after my board exam in 1949 I went to Professor Ludwig, director of the neuroanatomy in Basel. I said, sir, I am planning to be a neurosurgeon, but I should maybe better, a little more familiar. I never had a chance to dissect the brain. We heard the theoretic lectures. He said, this is surprising. And he called in from next room, Joseph Klinger. He get later doctor title, another doctor. He was a unique person. He published with the Klinger, with the, uh, Ludwig together in the Atlas over fiber system, 1953. And, and he was working on this here you see optics radiation system. Beautiful. And was very patiently dissecting. I spent three months with, with him. And then later on, I, five years, I brought to him preparates. But he said to me, good, don't give up. You are doing better. You are doing better. See, 1955. He went to Montreal to Professor Glor. Glor was our classmate in Basel. He get a great expert in electroencephalography, and he wrote in a most excellent book about the temporal law. And so he spent with him his work. Next slide. And this is my dissection. I found it. I made it some 20 such a preparate. Next slide, please. Here, preparing the volume for A, brain tumors, microsurgery. I made these pictures and Mr. Roth made that perfect. Just either we, what I did learn. Next, this was the other one. I showed the preparate of this picture was seen by colleagues and nobody they, they found this nice, nice. But Surya was different. In 1990 he came and said, why you are so precise in your movements around the system? I said, I know a little anatomy. Where did you learn? I said, look, I cannot inform you because I get the preparate prepared brain, but you have to go to Basel to learn yourself. So Thierry was unique. He went to Basel, spent time, and learned how to fix the brain, how to prepare it, and then started to make the fiber dissection in our laboratory on the microscope. Next slide. And you see here, this is his preparation. Next. Next. As I came 1953, 
to neurosurgery in January. Professor Hugo Kreimbull was from 36 to 72 chairman and director, upright person in hospital. We never saw him laughing, always very serious, strong. In asked me what you made it or so on. I explained what learned is on also neuroanatomy. Okay, he said, can you make a very good tennis angiography? I said, I will try. So next day I tried. Before they tried it, but they didn't succeed. It. Next time. Next. Next. Voice Ali. We had a, this system here. We could make a serial angiography, six serial, eventual nine series, manual removed by Miss Anna. Her sister made this photography. <laughs> and then I worked on this vertebral basilar arterial system and then later cerebral angiography, next edition, the, all the variations. But this operate you may have not seen, this is a very special when the artist used this. We made a subtraction uh, technique from this chemical subtraction or from angiographies. So the bone was gone and we saw only the arterial system six series from arteries and then next step, next step, capillaries within five seconds, six seconds until the sinus came up. So we saw first time the cerebral tomophlebitis. We presented this. And then we saw all the segmental unit especially vascularized glioma and meningioma on AVM. You could follow. And I am missing this system. You are now happy to have now so-called 3D MRI, but this system is much superior. I am sorry you don't have it. You should have it 3D MRI on this system. Then you can sit in I spent with Professor Kreimbill every afternoon between five to six, one hour there for next day cases. He discussed precisely what is there, what is there. So he's, he was learning, but I, I learned from him, but I was also telling him a little. So this was our teaching system. And this, this is very important. Next slide. Now, the arterial system is well studied, but variation is not well known. When a system in deep veins are well studied, but on surface, please find a book for me and tell me where these surface veins are well presented. Sylvian vein group, or ascending and or descending veins, individual variation. There is a no work about this. I was planning, but I ran into microsurgery. I left this field. You for the young colleague is great chance to go to this field to study the variation of the venous system. It's very interesting. There may be ten different types, but there are rules. Next. And I was very involved to work, this study the perforator system. And this sit in my brain deep. I know all the variation in the carotid and vertebral system. And well known is the perforator from the P1, but not known from the supracerebellar artery. There they go deeper part of the interpeduncular fossa. Next slide, please. And then we, Mr. Roth prepared this collateral system and get out some uh, 
respect from a company. They, they gave him an award for this. And this is in the book published. Now, the point is, we have four vessels and one can get occluded or two can get occluded. The collateral are perfect. Even four vessels can be occluded, but still the person cannot get problem until one moment. Professor Kikuchi, 1980s, published in journal, two cases, four vessel occlusion. Why? Because through the intercostal system, the spinal system, the collateral. So this should be more attention studied or realized because the people are <coughs> mixing. Stroke is entirely different disease than the TIA, the temporary ischemic attacks because the circulation is trouble. It's not a stroke. Stroke is a parenchymal damage. We have to help to the people by TIA, naturally. And then here came for me the great change. 1962, Professor Akasenik is a great heart surgeon from Sweden, Stockholm, was chosen to Zurich as a chairman of heart surgery. And he was great engineer, also great, made a new apparatus, blood exchanger, but they had a, some problem. Sometimes they get emboli. And a young girl, 17 year old, came up with right-sided hemiplegia and aphasia. And I made myself the angiography and showed him, here is the occluded central sulcus artery. He immediately packed me on my shirt, said, you like to operate carotid, but you should go to operate the brain arteries. You should operate this girl. I said, sir, we don't have the proper microscope. We don't have suture material and we have no training laboratory, nothing. So he insisted and in Zurich was built a modern training laboratory. Next slide. And then I had to go around and learn where I can go and learn microvascular surgery. Now, if we talk about the microscope, interesting to show in the history. Thousand years ago, from Kuwait, this genial engineer came to Egypt to help eventually the Nile River problems to solve. But he, he realized, he said, this doesn't work. And he retired and then he spent his life to study of eye. Eye anatomy and physiology perfectly studied and published. And this was a great surprise. He came from Egypt to Venedig, from Venedig to Europe. And then the people get, oh, this new world. Next slide. But it took a long time, look here. Until 17th century, we don't have a proper, even the oak trees are not there, but there are some glasses. And here in Dutch Holland, the Janssens and then Zippersheim and Matthews, they said, I am, I am the first. They made an excellent microscope and telescope. And we can see in the history, great philosopher and scientists have been invo involved. In London, there is an optician guild. And then I'd like to show you this here, Giuseppe Campani. 
Next slide, please. 1886, this picture published in Leipzig, 10 pictures are there. And he wrote a letter to the Pope is saying, this instrument is excellent. We can look to the sky and study the stars, but we can see the wand better. And you see here with a candlelight, it took 400 years before the micro microscope came in operating rooms. Next slide. Interesting. Anton van Leeuwenhoek, the Dutch businessman, wealthy, and he enjoyed also on sciences. And he got the idea to melt the glass and let make a drops and observe these drops magnify 200, 200, 300, 400 times. He saw erythrocytes, he saw the microbes, he saw spermin. So he, he was a great man at that time. Next slide. But in real systematic use was by Carl Olaf Nyland in Stockholm. He was otosclerosis expert. And this microscope was fixed on the operating table. Holm Gray and his teacher made a diploscope. Next. Now. Here we have an engineer, Dr. Littmann, and we have here Wolstein, very great professor in Würzburg, Germany. He made more than 1,000 otosclerosis. He created himself a more or less mobile microscope, Leica microscope, he put it. And then they worked together and make it this size of me one. And this was an excellent microscope, interesting. We didn't get available in Zurich. I saw this in Little Rock, sorry, in, 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 in Burlington, Vermont. And this is a one can see optic system change is a is a coaxial light and beam splitter you can put many cameras great idea this is really concept is great i went to see dr litman and at the end of my training in burlington he was very nice and he showed me he's working to put the laser system into the microscope. And I surprised him saying, open-minded, sir, laser is not good for the brain. It's a mode, but it's not good. He was shocked. And then I didn't get more help for our new microscope. Next. Then I built with the technical high school in Zurich, this counterbalance microscope, perfect in federalite to move. And you can move your hydraulic chair, armrest, microscope, all three with one pedal. This I used six years. And then I got this one here. And they produce two or three microscopes and the company collapsed because they couldn't sell. Nobody did like to buy it. Almaty has one such it. Next slide. Now, <laughs> Professor House, William House, was by Wolstein in Würzburg saw the otoscular surgery. He brought to United States, but he was not, he didn't get attention what he's doing. Hitchenberger, his assistant, 
he helped him a lot, but also he didn't get any respect for neurosurgical societies. Kirji, working in Los Angeles, same hospital, was impressed when he started. Kirji was one of the most intelligent person that I met, but he was maybe too intelligent. He was interested in many other problems. He made a really 10 different procedure on brain, on the microscope, but he didn't systematically fall. Then he visited me in Zurich and in also in Little Rock and get a good friend, but he, 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 he was not follower. But here, Hari Banchi was a great cos cosmetic surgeon, and he was the man the first time free transplant of finger and toes. And he, he was a great one. He, I, was, I visited in the United States some 20 places. He impressed me most. We lost him on a motor car accident. In Burlington, Dr. Jacobson, vascular surgeon, was impressed from, they discovered from ENT department, the microscope and used it and said, hey, it looks different. So he, he told me, like you are looking to the moon with a telescope. And Dr. Donahue was impressed from Jacobson. Together they tried to work on the middle cerebral artery and published and said open-minded is doesn't work. And here his friend Lohit in Toronto started off microtechnics. Next slide. But systematic use was not there. Doctor, we found the address here from Dr. Danahi through Dr. Sweet Boston. And I went to him and he accepted I should come over. I could go there 1965 and spend some 14 months. He spent one morning with me teaching how he is working. Then the rest time was Mrs. Roberts, Jackie is called. And she was the main teacher, very strong person. I learned most tricks from her. Next slide. And we could not go to the cortical arteries. There was no fine tissue material. I met here a patch on a dog. And this dog survived, although I put him at least three hours. Temporary clips, but he had a good collateral. Next slide. And then I applied on this one less than one millimeter size cortical artery, I made a patch. On this side, I have been the most happy man because this succeeded. And we made a, here a graft also, it is possible. And I said, now we can do it. Try to open here on cort cort cortical, it being over the sulcus here, it's here, this one centimeter long. You will see there are very fine perforator. And they, if they bleed, everything gets red. You lose the con control to see everything clear. So it's not easy, but we succeeded. Next slide. We succeeded, thank Professor Len Malis. And he made this simple bipolar, but it was excellent on work. Next slide. We have to thank also Dr. Alexis Carrel from Lyon, France. He went first to Montreal, then to St. Louis, United States, then finally Rockefeller Center in New York. He is the great man, unique, genial person, and he created the modern vascular surgery. He made the limb transplantation, so he's some way called father of immunology. He saw it doesn't work in every animal. You cannot do 
exchanges, he made a hard and long, long transplantation and other organ transplantation. 1912, he get Nobel Prize correctly. You must read as his life in internet. Next slide, please. Now, we have to learn brain anatomy, nerve anatomy, and then we have to learn vascular anatomy. What we have to learn the arachnoidal, cystinal anatomy. It is not just the cystine subarachnoidal going from there to there. Even in this area, there are many compartments. M1 is an own compartment, carotid is own, posterior communicating own, anterior cordial own, or here the optic system has own, and olfactory system, A1, A2, each one, but the arterial system has own, the nervous system has own, arachnoidal system. So the glioma cannot go from one to other one. The aneurysm stay inside of <laughs> the system. Now, I put in the volume one, three A and four A, some anatomical information. Next slide, please. There is a publication from Rechus, a great anatomist in Stockholm. He was a dean. They put 1975, a large two volume books in German. Until now, is not published in Jer in English. Pity. And somebody has to sit down and make a real cystinal anatomy in surgical view. And this should be worked out by neuroradiologists. This is the reason we have now, I, I don't know how 40 or 50,000 neurosurgeons, but there are a few colleagues they are a real expert to make a precise trans exploration. Next. In, in volume one is this. Around each nerve own sleep, around each artery own compartment. This, but this has to be worked out better. Next. Here's cerebral pontine area. Trigeminal is the own slip, and here the seven, eight, and here nine, 10, 11, 12 together with the arterial system. We have to know they are, they are some way irritated, can, can they get sticky, but if we, we have to respect these borderlines, then you can catch the tumors. Next. Clinical application. This young man has a suddenly right-sided hemiplegia and aphasia. And then he improved. But we met angiography, it's occluded. I proposed the surgery. I explored him and you see inferior trunk of M1 is sclerotic and interesting. He doesn't smoke. He never smoked. So we are always, we have the idea, nic nicotine make this. It's also a disease. I put some 20 suture here, single suture. And we see is well now recovered. Next slide, please. This can happen. Three vessel occlusion, or one vessel but occlude the collateral system also. This happened by children, I saw by more and more people. Next slide. It's happened. This gentleman came in age 57 and told us. If he turns his head to the left side, he cannot stay, he fell down. And I made him myself angiography. This is the one side, right side, left side, and all his 
brain get only from vertebral artery, left side, right? It's not there. I told him we should make a bypass. He said, great, do it tomorrow. So he was there. Next slide. We made him this extra intracranial bypass. The artery was also some two millimeter, and this was a one millimeter. Next slide. As you see, he got an excellent collateral system, no new extra intracranial. And you see here, he's doing well. He died in eight, age of 61 on heart problem. There are many publications about the extra intracranial bypass. I must tell, tell often minded, I see very rare, good functioning extra intracranial bypass. There must be technical difficulties. I see excellent best take by Reichmann. He retired now, he was in Chicago. And I see also by Ture, he's very precise. Though. Next slide. Here, next slide, please. This was made by my, this is your case. Yes. That's the, the, the Tourette's case, yeah. Next slide. Now, it is a hit, interesting, funny story. One of the trained men as a cardiac surgeon in Zurich was from Kenya. He returned mm -hmm. to Kenya and sent to me later this picture. They had a one boy had a headache and they found pulsating something on his parietal area, right side. And you see, spontaneous transcranial extra intracranial bypass. So if the, the brain need flow, blood, try to find somewhere. And so the nature helps. So the discussion later, they, they made a trial. We never said this bypass is good for stroke. We said it is only for the trouble hemodynamic by occlusion one, two, or three vessel, but not for the stroke. This next slide. Here's another case, large aneurysm. I explored, but I saw I cannot put any clip here. It's an enormous, large base. So I saved the anterior cordial artery and clipped the carotid and made him bypass. And you see, entire media is filled from this extra intracranial bypass. Myself, I made some 31 cases, but my people made around 180. Imho published this. Next slide. Next. AVM, short, I do a great time. <laughs> really? <laughs> the AVM can be in different part of the brain. In the cephalon, neocortical, neopaleal, or in limbic system or central. And we can almost operate almost 95% of them. I will show you some example. Next. Professor, you can... Hmm? Yeah, you can continue. There's still 5,000 people. What do you want me to listen to this? Ah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is a right sided mediobasal temporal AVM with bleeding. This has to be removed because by radiation, I am not very impressed. Also, not by embolization, they get some 40%. But in our procedure, we are 100% able to remove complete. We have some negative results, but I will tell you. 
here you see next slide Professor would operate maybe supracerebral transcendoria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, better the control. But one point is here why I am showing to you. It is not still not accepted. We believe if the people have a continuous seizure, the indication for surgery given, especially if there is a bleeding. But this is an indication. You know what happened here? You see, straight sinus in trouble, stenotic and galenic vein in dilatated because it cannot flow. And this, this caused the bleeding. And most of the AVM have this, when you, if you pay attention. This is the one main reason why we have to operate next. You see, by the surgery, we can also remove the area where the blood make the remain here, hemosiderin. We remove hemosiderin because hemo the brain doesn't like hemosiderin and get seizure. Next slide. Now, this is one of the high point for myself. This young lady came working by a medical doctor with bleeding left-sided lentiform nucleus area bleeding and did something to you and then the angiography showed this is coming from all perforators of the carotid on media next slide please We have to wait, not because we did like it, but her father was in military service and had to come, permission, etc., and came, and then we operated. She insisted, she said, don't worry, professor, you will help me. And I removed this lesion and with all these perforators, but I did know her internal capsule is from the anterior kernel that the supply and posterior kernel. And she's she's working now in the in the in literal in the hospital. Get married and has a child. Next slide. <coughs> this is another. This is galenic vein. This impressed very much. But pay attention, straight sinus is occluded. There are many new channels. This looked very difficult. It is difficult, but we could manage it because it doesn't expand into the, the encephalon. There are not parts of the encephalon. And you see, we rescued all the perforator from P1 and the super cerebral. And she's a, she get a dentist. Next slide. And this boy, you see, this is occlusion is here in the herophilia area. He's enlar enormous enlargement, very unusual. And then he gets a trouble in the entire phase. Next slide. We could manage it. This clip it was stupid. It was not necessary to put any clip there. But you see, everything normalized. I operated 16 this time, Berenic AVM, but four I lost because they have been parts in the the encephalon and mesencephalon. I couldn't go and attack and I left there. And soon they get the next bleeding and died. I still suffer on this negative result. Yeah. 
I have other negative results. Altogether, some 600 cases operated altogether in five. I feel myself un unhappy. Next slide. Now, shortly about tumors. We are learning frontal, parietal, proximal, temporal lobes. They are lobes, but it's better say regions with the frontal gyri and, and this authentic area, central, is anatomically and histologically is separated, this area. And also the lesions. I operated only two cases with the tumors here. And as I remember, Professor Tira has already now 50 cases. Presental. Presental. Presental tumor. They can be, op if we stay in the tumor, you can remove it and they do very well. So we have the tube, we have, as I entered the neurosurgery, 1953, the available angiography and air studies allowed to localize some 20 lesion, craniospinal. And then until micro neurosurgery, they have been 50. Because with the vertebral angiography we introduced, we could make more. The, precise diagnosis and the better angiography technique. But in between, we have now the super selective angiography. We have a CT computer tomography, 20 or 30 different MRI modalities. And we have a microsurgery experience and then micro endovascular approaches. We see segmental and to, suddenly we can realize, hey, there are different parts. We have here neopallial, in paleopallial, archipallial areas in the brainstem. And they stay in their group. A tumor here stay in this segment. A tumor stay here, extend here. It looks like it is an infiltrative. This is the most wrong definition from Virchow. Infiltration doesn't occur. It is expansion, it looks like. And also these tumors all remain. And now, if I ask you, in insular, now it is well known. Until we started microsurgery, the operated, nobody was discussing this. Inoperable. No, you, you can operate very well. We have now here a great number. But these are the sub -op opercular gyri. They are called transverse gyri. And I call related to the ecker tertiary gyri. There are 16 gyri. The tumor may arise here, only here, only here, only here. I had a sum, I had a two in this area, so called transverse temporal gyri. I operated four patients with the tumor in this area. After seizure, they had a speech problem. But by surgery, we saw the lesion was in the subopercular part by tertiary gyri. This area was intact. They remain intact. And then the microsurgery also discovered here in the limbic system, septal areas and subcolossal area, and here, cingulate area anterior, middle, posterior, and then here, parahippocampus with oncus, in inferior temporal pole area. Separated lesions arise in some turf areas. 
And this is here, the subcolloidal areas, you will see, we have to differentiate this. this. This area is entirely different in human, but entirely, but highly differentiated in human. And there are very rare pictures in all atlases of the primates, huge atlases, but mostly lateral pictures are presented, but never medial pictures. If some few, this area is not developed. In human is this area developed. Everybody talks about prefrontal. What is prefrontal? It's not well defined. This is very, this is a rostral area, superior, middle, inferior rostral area. So we have separate more detail these things. And next slide. I'm running faster. We can separate now the neopaleal, paleopaleal, archipaleal area on brain stem. And the MRI, the people can, but T2, can, they can differentiate it very well, these areas. Next slide. In the lesion, arise here, segmental. Segmental unit has an external part visible on surface, but at the end of sulcus is enter subcortical area going down to the ventricle where the cell migration occur. This is the a gyral segmental unit in the lesion occur in this area, in here, like here. This is made by Valavanis. This put together how it looks. They are ex expansive and compress. They give the impression something infiltrating. Next slide. Here, different areas. Next. All together, some seven, over 700 cases in medieval temporal and multi-compartmental pure insula, and then pure, pure cingulate, and the colonial cingulate, orbitofrontal septal, mammillary form. For all these patients, some four, 5,000 brain tumors, AVMs, I never saw any aggressive behavior, criminal behavior, preoperative and postoperative. This is interesting fact. The brain resistant to this. This is something different to criminality and affect disturbances. But here on these four cases, mammillary, and also Dr. Tiris, two, three cases, the people are different. There are more, and most young students, school children, they get aggressive to other children and the teacher, they make attention to the family and the family get the doctors and then finally the mammalian tumor. And after removal, they get quiet. And this is very interesting. I am not entering this here more because we are preparing now our book because I operated great number of cases also in Little Rock and other centers. We, I should, before I live forever, <laughs> I should inform the, the, the material is there. Next, it is on the time. I like to make attentions. This young man came to Little Rock and pay attention here, very unique. It looked like a multi-compartment lesion involving the insula and caudal from the orbital and septal area and medieval temporal. And we had an excellent neuroradiologist in Little Rock, Professor Antiaco from Philippines. He was a great man. He lost him also early, just two years ago. He said to me, look here, T2 
Here's, here's the cortex involved. This never happened in glioma. So we made to this man lumbar puncture and studied the sugar level. It was low. So therefore, this is a tubercloma. And he was treated and went back to home, but never sent his poster. But we heard he is doing well. Next. But this man was diagnosed with tumor. And this man was also the first man also. All these tumors, limbic tumors, they can be huge. The people still are awake. But these two people, they have been somnolent. So we made again also here the investigation. This was also tuberculoma. And now this gentleman is a patient of Dr. Ture. And he's still coming to control. We saw him just a few weeks ago, doing very well. Everything done. Next. Not everything is still, but here, look here. It's a large lesion. They can be only small or the middle size. I operated in two sessions here and from backside. Anaplastic astrocytoma. Next slide. Believe or not, she survived 22 years. And just a few months ago, she died. Next slide. Here, huge lesion. How, how is her condition, cycle? She's a well-known lawyer in Italy. And she came with the whole family and she was translating the family. It was said it is infiltrating. No, it looked like something, but it's not. It is only parahippocampus in the inferior temporal area. She was intact. Next slide. After removal. Next slide. Another kid. Singular colosal. They they go mostly up with the secondary gyri and all down to the corpus callosum because they have the same artery vascularized, disintegrate into the corpus callosum. Next slide. But another case here. This young lady has a precuneus elision. When she came from other state in the United States to, li to literal and said, I'm an artist, I need my visual field, both sides. You can give any guarantee? I said, no, we can try it. We made it, and we succeeded. You see, intact. Because it just go to this area, just in the precuneus. And turn out also anaplastic oligo in this case. It's surprising. She's also since 22 years still alive and still well-known artist. Next slide. Product productive. Another case of the insula. The secretary. Next slide. Oh, I forget what the also productive, but it's in the in the book, in the volume 4B is there. But this case is interesting. This man is a wealthy person, had a, in a discussion with his group, seizure, and they found this lesion. Look here. Media was out, temporal, insular, posterior, frontal, orbital, and septal area. I, he sent the picture to me, to Little Rock. I said, come over, we had to operate. He didn't come, but some 10 years later, he came. 
You see what happened? The tumor get local swollen and we have still a putamen pallidum and he was still intact. No deficit, internal capsule intact. Now I'm in shame to show you showed this afternoon as much beautiful presenting pictures. This, I, you made a advance in this. We operated, you see. It's recovered. It's just compressed. It's not infiltrating. It's, next slide. And here, look here, this case. Huge, it looked like. But I removed all the system. Next slide. And this young lady survived 30 years in writing nice poetry. A very nice person. She said, I will survive here for my daughter, but she died after. We couldn't help. It just get more high malignant and nothing. Next, I'm coming to them. Here, you see this. What is this? This is the same area, but this is an optic nerve tumor after removal. I have some 70 cases of optic glioma. They can be also anaplastic. Next. Craniopharyngiomas, the most baffling problem that confronts the neurosurgeon, 1932. By Cushing, next slide. The point is, I made now around 220 craniopharyngioma. They can be all completely removed. We have to pay attention. In this parachiasmatic area, chiasma and optic tract, they have their own slim arachnoid. In the stalk, and behind the chiasma, there's an own slip, comes down around the hypothesis. So the tumors coming from here, they go around, they never go into the optic nerve. They can bad com compress. We have to know this arachnoidal system well. This is Sylvian, this is the carotid, they have each own slip. Next slide. You see, if the tumor grow up, they cut the nerves here, optic channel, or just here, here like here, A1, A1 cut it, damage. We, can, we don't see very well, the projector is not good. Next slide. Here, another point, this large craniopharyngioma, most of these children, half children, half adult, have optic problem, visual problem. But here, pay attention. There is no hydrocephalus. The tumor came up to the foramen mandrel, but CSF is running some way. And it can be removed, full of problems, but still can be removed completely. Next. But here, the tumor is not so big, but occluded with problem. And I operated two children, and I believed I made it well, and we made it complete. In post-operative, first day was okay. Second day, they start in trouble, etc. We believe these are the hypothalamic problems. And we lost the children. By autopsy, we saw it was a hematoma. I realized here, I have the section on the movie. They get sticky on the choroid plexus, vascularization. So if you have this condition, you have to combine it. This means subfrontal approach, perichiasmal, subchiasmal, 
and then interim is very down, you can take it. Next, like here, combined upward, so called. We published in my Norris version. Next slide. I'm at the end. I'm not presenting more as I saw what Dr. Tira made it now. We made it at some pioneer work on thalamus, hypothalamus work, but now it's much preciser. And here, look here, this lesion. And how the fiber track compressed but not damaged. And this poster project. This is a microsurgery. This makes me happy. Next slide. Oh, this was my case. Was it your case, Dr. Mm -hmm. This is your case. Previous one was mine. This is astrocytoma. I had the chance to operate only 12, but you have now got me how many? Almost 100. Seven. Seven. Great number. Next slide. Now, this is unique case, the last <laughs> case. She came from other country. They diagnosed a glioblastoma in pons and started radiation. But the father was opposing. And then he sent the picture to Professor Ture. He said, he's not sure. Maybe he's a cavernoma. Next slide. Here is the picture. And it was a cavernoma. Now, next slide. This is, this is our award. This is the impact of my surgery. One year later, she get married. One case made her so happy. Next slide. But this is the opposite. I saw at least 150 or more patients came in United States on Zurich, on here, children, adults with these lesions. What can be done? Maybe tractography, but Professor Tillet left me the tractography by Zeynep Frapp and they may, but they saw some fibers run through. So this is the end of the story of my coronary surgery. Next slide. This is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> Come to Krishna. You're muted, okay. Dad. Thank you, Professor. And thank you for the opportunity. And uh, thank you. You have been patient for allowing me two hours to rape. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We can go much longer, but I know it's already late. It's almost 10 o'clock in Istanbul. I appreciate all the, the effort. Thank you very much. This was thank inspiring. You. And uh, we have a a total of about 6,000 people from around the world. And everybody wow. was sending all the thanks for all the speakers, especially for Professor as well. And uh, this was a great uh, historic moment. Um, and uh, we're hoping to see you in person soon also. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Al-Mefti, uh, any comment? First, I want to thank two people who have helped put this together. It's uh, Dr. Aboud and uh, my daughter Gina, who was uh, managing uh, the session to make sure that we end up with no problems. So everything went well. Thank you for the great hours. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor. Dr. Al Mefti. Oh, well, can't thank you enough. This is a is just a, a historical moment. It was so good to hear the professor and listen to him. A, uh, thank you and Ture and uh, Paulo for beautiful lecture. We learned enough. Uh, I just thank you all on behalf of all the 6,000 which are out there and I was one of them. Thank you. I have been very impressed from your Fontaine tumor approaches. Thank you very much. But I'm also very impressed. How come you get younger? <laughs> you know, Professor, uh, I don't have to worry much since I left the chairmanship. I'm so happy I can. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Professor, Professor Ture, also thank you very much uh, for all your efforts and hope to see you in person when everything uh, is finished. And also, Paolo, thank you very much. Good to see you and see your be better half also. <laughs> thank and you. The th and thank and you. the thanks for everybody joining us today. It's really, you know, their being there is what to make the difference. Yeah, we. it is uh, 2 a.m. in the Far East, and there is a total about uh, close to 5,000 5, people still at 2 a.m. in the morning. So okay. Thank you bye good bye. night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.